Um, there is a lot to cover, but there's a theme in chapter 7, which is the continual idea of where someone finds themselves. If you're a Christian and you're married, if you're, if you're a Christian and you're single, if you're engaged, wherever you find yourselves... I think Paul would say, you got to live ready. You've got to be ready at any given time. And I don't think that that's something that we say enough of in the American church. I don't think we talk about it enough. I think we talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, and I mean just the real church. There's a lot of teachings. There's there's five million people on YouTube that are teaching the Bible every day. You can go learn whatever you'd like. If you're into end time stuff, if you're into angels, if you're into whatever. But this idea of living ready and the implications of what that means. And what that means is, what is your life like right now? And what do you maybe need to shed from your life? Those are uncomfortable conversations. But there's a lot uncomfortable in 1 Corinthians 7, tons. Um, if you've listened to the last few weeks, you know that Paul doesn't like hide stuff. He just goes right at it. And so we attack it just like he would. But this idea of living ready is woven throughout the book, but specifically this chapter. And so I want to, as we wrap it up, I want to reference these couple of, like I underlined them. I think you should too if you underline your uh, anything in your Bible. He talks about the idea of the present distress of the time. Time is short. Use this, what time you have. Don't misuse it. So we're going to get into um, a couple of themes. But in verses 25 through 28, he says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give... I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress. That is good, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. He says, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed or don't seek to try and get out of it. Are you bound uh, loosed from a wife? Don't seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So there's tons in this. And we want to, I want to just attack the, the, you know, the elephant in the room whenever you read this is what does this word really mean? And so there's, there's several translations. It seems to be that this passage in the entire 40 verse chapter has, if you, if you, uh, there's 40 different versions of the Bible. You can go get like uh, on Amazon right now. You can anything from the NASB to NIV to uh, NLT. We're in the New King James, but there are a few versions that take some liberties here. Not specifically just here, but in this chapter. And so we're going to highlight those. And I don't think that they do it um, to try to uh, be kind of like loosey-goosey with the text, but they there is some struggle with the Greek in this for certain uh, translations and certain uh, commentators kind of go, ah, I think he's kind of more talking about this. We're going to get there. But in this case, virgins can be young women or unmarried people. And so he says, given the present distress in the general area or of this city, it's good for you to remain as you are. In Corinth, Paul doesn't specifically say it, but a lot of commentators talk about the fact that some Christians had already lost their lives for being, had, had been killed for being Christians. And so he knows about this, and he is writing this, obviously, like not in Corinth. And so he's writing a response to questions they asked him. And so he says, hey, if you can remain as you are, if... If God has gifted you in this way, meaning you have the gift of celibacy or you have the gift of singleness translated in today's American vernacular, then stay that way. Remain as you are. Because the, the present distress is not going to ramp down, it's going to ramp up. And, you know, I, I would tell you that in America, we've had a very long time of peace. I was Googling... How long have we been at peace? Well, peace is if there's any conflict. So we've really never been at peace since, you know, 250 years ago. But there's been a few decades where there's been economic prosperity 
and one of those was the 20s, the roaring 20s. Going into the late 20s was a very prosperous time. And there's other people who say the 70s were pretty good, uh, depending on which part of the 70s you're talking about. And then obviously the late 80s, from um, I would say 85 to 99, they said it was relatively peaceful and relatively good economically speaking. And in those times, people start to relax a little bit. They start to go, well, now's the time. Money's cheap. We got, I mean, interest rates back then, we, we think they're high right now. And they are for the last 25 years. But they were really, really, really high in the late 80s, or in the late 70s, early 80s. And so as people start doing better, they're like, hey, let's get a bigger house. Let's get that suburban. Let's get that second home. And so people start really laying down roots on this planet. And we've talked about in the past when we've dealt with passages like Live Ready, the idea of bringing all of your stuff to a hotel. Shannon and I like to staycation in this town, mostly because we've got a farm, and so you can't get very far away from these animals that we have, um, and they require a lot of attention. But we like to go to, this town has amazing hotels, amazing resorts. I have a friend that hooks me up at one of these places, and we like to go there. We would never bring like everything we own to the La Paloma. We'd never do that. Why? Because you know you're going to be there for two days, three days. It's a temporary living situation. And so you just bring the bare necessities. And that is the underlying theme. Paul's like, whatever you can do to keep a light touch, to live and remain as you are, whatever that is, remain that way because of the present distress. If you're, if you're unmarried and you can stay that way, then stay that way. If you're married, stay that way. Don't try and get out of it because you think that it's better to be single. Once again, he says, it's not a commandment, but I do think that God gives me truth. And I think I'm trustworthy. And I think that's very obvious if you read the scriptures. They didn't have the whole, all of Paul's letters like you and I can just read any of them right now we want to. But it's obvious that God had gifted Paul to teach, but mostly in this case, to write. And so he says, hey, it's not a commandment. Becoming married, being single, the, the present climate's going to get worse. And so, um, I want to read a uh, just a, a really cool, I thought, a, a super cool quote from David Lowry about this. Um, he says, um, the present crisis may have referred to persecution being suffered by the Corinthians. Um, some commentators say that it was starting to really ramp up. Some say that the Christians had been killed in that town. Um, but he says, um, whatever, uh, uh, in view of his silence in the letter about any present suffering on their part, the latter point of view is, pres is preferred that there is a crisis in your town uh, in all, I mean, for throughout Corinth, he says a perceived state of well-being or even positive euphoria. Still, when persecution came, as Paul felt it surely would ramp up, its onslaught could be handled more ably by being single than being married. Um, one commentator was talking about if you're a single person and you are living for Christ and you're like, I'll die for Christ. I was way crazier in my early 20s than I am right now. I did skydiving twice in my early 20s and then my wife gave me a present and made me skydive at 35 and that was a very, very different deal. I told one of my friends, I'm like, why was I terrified? He goes, because you got four kids, man. Like, you, like, why in the world would you not be? You have, you have all these people that, that rely on you and you had nothing back then. You literally had like 15 cents to your name. Somebody bought it for you. Well, let's do it. Who cares? I got nothing. Now you have stuff. Now you have things. So you have to manage that properly. You have to keep everything in the proper perspective. Obviously, God cares cares about my kids, my wife, and he wants me to, to fulfill my responsibility there, but at the same time, he also wants me to live ready. In verse uh, 29, he says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they didn't possess. And those who use this world and not misusing it, 
for the form of this world is passing away. It's a big deal because he's talking about the idea of whatever you are in this life, that you should also can consider that not the most important thing in your life. He's not saying, hey, if you're married, don't care about your marriage. He's not saying that. It sounds sometimes in the, King, the New King James like it's like, huh, that's pretty, that's pretty pointed. That's pretty pressing. But he's saying, guys, time is short. You have, to, you have to realize that. And if you don't realize that, then you'll go all in with all these things. And you'll never see what, we're tr what, what is coming. You'll never, I mean, if you just say, hey, this is all there is. I'm going to lay down anchor. I'm going to do whatever I've got to do to have the American dream and to build up my credit and my money and my assets and all these things, which is fine in the proper perspective. And with the proper, like, God first, family second, all these, there's, there's, a, there's a pecking order to stuff in general. And so he says, uh, hey, your marriages, your homes, your financial security, they tend to occupy a great percentage of your mental energy. It's just the way it is. With the political climate of their time, as well as the culture around them, Paul was urging them to set their hearts on the spiritual and not the temporal. The world is passing away, and many people really don't think about that a lot. They really don't ever go there. Hey, what are you going to do in the next life? What are you doing to build up, to store up treasures in that life, which will last for forever? So he's trying to get them to understand this. Hey, whatever you are, consider that thing less than your spiritual destiny. No matter what it is, that's a proper perspective. He says in verse 32, But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin, meaning an unmarried person. There's a huge difference. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that that she may be holy both in body and one in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. When I was in my early 20s, I got like my dream job. And I wasn't like, I wasn't very serious about my faith. I had grown up around church. I was a professional church person. I had professional church answers. I had all of the religious things that people practice in church in general. It was a huge church and you, you know exactly what to say when somebody says something to you at church, even though the night before I was at the rock station DJing and playing songs that hopefully these people never heard. But I was having a great time. And I was very enamored with, at 22, being on the big rock station in a city like Chicago. And so my buddy was, we went to a Bible college together and he had just gotten married. And he was like sort of living through me. He's like, man, I wish I could do what you do. And I was going on tours with um, a couple of my friends were in a band and they had a bus and I love that. I love, I love tour buses. I love traveling by bus. I know it's kind of dumb, but I love it. Um, so we were in Florida for one tour. We were in Los Angeles for a tour. And he's like, dude, that is so cool. I'm like, dude, you're married. I wish I was married. He's like, yeah, it's great. But like, I can't do what you can do. I'm like, I know, and I'm not married. I would love to, like, you're starting your life together and your wife's pregnant. That's awesome. You're going to have a kid. Like, enjoy it. But we both wanted the life the other one had. That's the way it is. And he's saying, there's a difference between somebody who's married and somebody who's not. There's a huge difference in responsibilities, but no matter what, make sure that you're ready. God obviously started marriage in Genesis chapter 2. He's the one that said, hey, this is how marriage is going to be. One man, one woman, they're going to leave their families, cleave, they're going to be together. It's a union, and that, that is the basis of family. That is how we will, as Christians, as Hebrews, populate the earth. And at, the, at the same time, Paul was single. There's people who say, I don't know that he was ever married. There's other people who go, well, he was headed for the Sanhedrin, so he had to have been married. At some point in time, there's other guys who go, well, when he walked away from what that would have been, which was a big deal, by the way, what, like, how politically powerful Paul would have been since uh, everybody knew who he was and they were blown away by his intellect and how much he could memorize and how much he knew about the law. 
that his wife, when he gave up his um, that path for Christ, that a lot of guys were like, his wife left him. Because now they're unequally yoked. She's Hebrew and now he's coming to Christ. And everything about him that maybe she fell in love with was like, I consider it rubbish. That's what he said. And so she, she may have bailed out. Whatever the case is, Paul was single at the time that he wrote this. And he wasn't saying marriage is bad. He was saying, what are you going to do, young man, if they, if they try and torture one of your kids? And try and kill one of your kids? And go, all you got to do is denounce Jesus. Well, that's a burden that's extra that a single person doesn't have. And that's what he's saying. There's a difference between the state of life. There's a difference between where you're at. I hear kids all the time in this culture say, I'm never getting married. I'm never having kids. That's like, that's like almost conventional wisdom now. I don't think that it's good. I, I mean, I think you, you always have to... You, you always have to bring that, your future spouse type stuff, you have to bring that to God. You have to deal with that with God. Hey, maybe God want, maybe God, maybe time is way shorter than all of us think. Maybe like Christ is coming back like super, super soon. And so you need to not only be ready, but you're not even going to have the time to get married and to have a huge family because there's not that much time left. And so maybe God is doing something with this younger generation and saying, hey, we're almost done. So get out there and be a light. I don't know. It's interesting to me that because I never heard that everybody in the 90s when I was young, we all wanted to, uh, to get married and have uh, families. All of us. I mean, I don't know anybody in my youth group of 200 kids that didn't want that. But now I hear that a lot. So he says in verse 35, And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Guys, distractions. We've talked about distractions so many times. They're everywhere. People are distracted to no end. I mean, you don't have to look very far. There's people watching movies next to you in traffic on their phone. Like, it's right where their eyes should be, staying between the lanes. Shannon, I mean, we see this all the time. We were on the, uh, on the road like two days ago. She's like, that person on I-10 to your left is we're in that area where they took it um, off the freeway and made it a frontage road, like by sunset. And she's, it, so you're, we're serpentining. We're swerving a lot. And she's just literally, I didn't see her, but she's literally watching a movie. We're watching, I'm mean, like... That's a distraction to the 10th power. You can't drive and be watching a movie. But the enemy is great at distracting people. The enemy is the ultimate, like he's a magician at this, at distracting people from what? From thinking about this topic. From thinking about, hey, you may not be here next week, but you are going to talk to God either way. Whether it's next week or in the next 70 years, you're going to. So do you think you should be ready for that conversation? Ah, don't worry about it. You got tons of time. Not really, really, really not. I don't know what, I don't know, like life is quick. I've never in my life heard somebody on their deathbed and, th and have them say anything except for I wish I had more time. I feel like I just was a kid and life was a blink. That's what every person that's older that I've been with them as they died or about to die, that's what they all say. No one, no one says, man, life felt like five million years. No one. I've never heard anybody say that. I hear like five-year-olds say that, but that's because five-year-olds have a very different world they live in. But Christians, in this case, he's saying, guys, I'm not going to put a leash on you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm giving you principles, and I think based on where things are at, where the climate is, that you are going to have less distractions and less yoke, if you will, less burdens if you can remain the way that you are. But distractions, like I say, he's trying to help them understand that there are a million things coming in our world. There's a lot of stuff around the, around the corner and we never know like where that's going to be. I feel like in my own life, I'm a super distracted person, super ADD person. I feel like God is like all the things I've wanted to do, all the, like, the business interests I have, like, I feel like God has like like thrown like water on a fire with a lot of those things lately. And it's like, I can't even explain it, but I'm like, man, I'm not even interested in that. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that. 
and, and I'm interested in like almost everything. Like if you guys own a business, I could have lunch with you and talk to you about your business and ask you questions all afternoon, no matter what the business, I'm interested in it. That's just how I am. I'm a very curious person. But lately, God's been like, it's like he's thrown a huge wet blanket on all those things. And I'm like, that's interesting. I didn't do that. But he's, he's, Paul's like, guys, I'm not trying to tell you you can't do this. I'm not trying to tell you don't get married for sure. Don't stay single. Don't, whatever the case is. But understand the times. Understand what's around the corner. Um, this last part is probably maybe the most misunderstood part of this chapter, and I'm gonna we're gonna get into um, the last bulk of this. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar or not with it, but it's an interesting uh, couple of verses. He says, "But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry." Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then, he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. There's so much in this, um, and, and once again, I, I'm only explaining it because I feel like it's so misunderstood, and I feel like it's it's potentially mocked by uh, the secular world, but these are Greek words, and the translation is interesting. So I want to read um, another quote for, by David Lowry on this. Um, he says, the interpretation and translation of this passage is difficult. Uh, as the alternative marginal trans, uh, translation indicates, the issue revolves around whether the indefinite pronoun anyone refers to a father or to a prospective bridegroom, so someone who's engaged to a woman. So that's, that's really what you're going to get. And the reason I say this is because if you're reading out of a different translation than me, and I know our, the guy who teaches for me the most is always in the NIV because that's what he preaches out of, that's fine. Um, I'm just messing with you. Uh, NIV's great. But the NIV translators following most modern commentators have adopted the latter point of view, but have included the traditional interpretation in the margin. So if you have a reference Bible on the left-hand side or at the bottom, it should say what that word translates. Translates to. Um, he says, the strength of the bridegroom view lies in the fact that it permits a consistent subject for the verbs used throughout this passage, a strength which the NIV translators forfeited by making the virgin the subject of the phrase getting along in years. This decision was probably prompted by the need to explain why the bridegroom might be thought to act improperly. In other words, delaying marrying her. That's what we're talking about. Not something gross, like the world would probably say. But delaying and marrying her, and that's a big deal, especially in a Jewish uh, worldview in, in, in the culture, because if he doesn't, it, ad that it adversely affects her chance of ever getting married. So if she feels like, hey, I got to be married, I want to be married, this guy's just waiting and waiting and waiting, he's listening to Paul, and he's like, are you ever going to like marry me? And he's like, I don't know, like Paul's making it, he's like, it's kind of spooking me out with what's going to happen. Like, I don't want to have us get married, have a kid, and then crazy stuff happens. And so he's like, hey, if you can, it's okay. Either way, it's okay. Some translators take this and they say, this is the father who has given his daughter away, or maybe not. And he goes, hey... I'm your dad, and their culture, you have to understand, we, we buck against this in our culture because we don't do arranged marriages. A lot of the world still does them back then, big time. So you have to like put yourself in, okay, so if, if you moved right now to India, that's the norm. You're not the norm. So you're like the one who's like, oh man, this is strange. No, no, you're living in a culture that that's what they do, and so you're the one that's strange. So we have to understand culture, like where you are, where you might jump into in a culture where mom and dad are vetting people, talking to people. They have a very different culture in terms of family relations with other people. They know certain people really, really well. They've watched this kid grow up. They've watched this girl grow up. And so he's saying, hey, maybe you dad, some commentators say, maybe he's talking about um, saying, hey, I'm not giving you away. 
And Matt, I know you like this guy. I know he likes you. I know you talked about being betrothed or, or engaged, but I, I'm, I'm putting the, the stop on it. That's what we're talking about here. And so, once again, the passage is misunderstood, and I would say even taken out of context sometimes, depending on who you're listening to. But the point is the same. Whatever you end up doing, so then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not does better. Why? Because now she's not encumbered. And if things are going to get really, really brutal, and I believe they are going to be very brutal in our culture, just like their culture, I believe they're kind of tracking in the same way. Because uh, we've talked about this in the past, that living the Corinthian way is like saying to somebody, dude, are you from Vegas? You seem like a Vegas person. We know what that means. We know the undertones of that. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, as if. Um, but we know that. We, we've seen the commercials. We've heard people say this on TV. And so if, if things are going to get really, really, really bad, like could you imagine setting up this amazing party, this amazing marriage, this amazing day, and as you come in, like, oh, it's a Christian marriage, and the authorities come in and start killing people. Like you could avoid that by just remaining and waiting because persecution comes in waves and it goes in waves. John MacArthur, I remember as a kid, uh, was, was praying for persecution, not praying against it. He was praying that it would ramp up. Well, he's got his prayer request uh, answered because it is ramping up. But he says, hey, God does amazing things when the church is persecuted. This is true. This is true throughout Scripture. It's true throughout history. And he's saying, hey, if you can stay that way, young maiden, young unmarried, then do it. Even though singles ministries in churches are a little strange. Just have to say that. I've been around a lot of them, and it seems like an interesting sect of the Christian church. Singles ministries. And then the guys that, are, that lead them, the singles pastors, that's an interesting call too. Um, because if they're single, a few years later they're not, and then you gotta, we got to move you into something else. Marriage ministry or something. So, just the way it is. Um, so, verse 39 and 40, to close it, a wife is bound by law as, as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord, meaning only a Christian. If you're a Christian, you need to marry somebody who has the exact same faith as you, not somebody who says they're a Christian and is like, ah, I don't really know. I mean, I guess it's the best option. I guess you're a Christian. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll click that box or whatever. No, on the same level. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. So once again, he's saying, hey, I see what's happening where I am. I see what's happening in your town, and I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to save you guys some stuff. Marriage is awesome, but the climate is really, 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 it's like, like this hurricane in San Diego. They've never had one, or, or, or whatever, this tropical storm that's happening like as we speak. Like, I'm like, San Diego's never, ever had a hurricane? Well, I love NASA, because NASA had the audacity to say that this was the uh, hottest July on record. But they've only been keeping records for 200. Out of 80 billion years of, of weather. Um, it seems like a low sample size. I don't know. To make that assertion, 200 years out of 80 billion, I don't know. It doesn't seem NASA-esque, unless there's another angle. I don't know. Maybe I'm out there. So Paul's affirming the marriage covenant as long as you take it to the end, till death do us part. He also says that if that's the case, you are going to be less encumbered if you remain single. Not a commandment, but a recommendation. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe, like I said, maybe God's doing something with this generation. Maybe the time is like way shorter than people think it is. And God's like trying to raise people up and hey, just go be a missionary. You don't have tons of time. You can, you can move way less encumbered. I remember, um, I love my family. I love being married. I love having five kids. But I remember uh, I was at this job I hated. Um, I was selling medical supplies downtown Chicago and I get a call from a band and they're like, hey, meet us in Nashville tonight. Your ticket's in your email, and we're going on tour. I'm like, done. Soul. I just quit my job. I just left. I just left the job. Uh, went to Midway Airport and landed in Nashville, and they picked me up in the bus, and we went to Florida, and it was cold outside. It was Chicago in December. I was like, this is the best thing ever. You can't do that and stay married. 
And if you can, then somebody's not talking to you and telling you the truth, the other half. But anyway, wrapping this up, three quick deals. The first one is being ready for Christ's return is essential for all believers. Two-year-old believers, three-year-old believers, 90-year-old believers. Every person needs to be ready. This is not a thing that applies to a certain age group. We have to be ready. We have to continue to study the word, to show ourselves, up, show ourselves approved, and to know what God is saying, to know what God is doing. If a teacher told a group of young students, we used to have these tornado drills in Chicago, this little school I went to. Uh, we used to have fire drills, and they'd, they would pull it, and the fire department was like already en route and stuff. And it was like, come on, like we already kind of know some of this stuff is happening. But if a teacher told a group of students that sometime during the day there would be a fire drill and all the students must exit the room, then the students who are intelligent are the ones that park themselves in the most ready positions. The ones that put themselves in the, 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 the chair, if it's open seating, right by the door. Because they're like, I believe her. I believe that we're going to have that. And even more so if she said, hey, whoever does the best or whoever does the fastest, uh, whatever we have to go through for this, you're going to get a prize. The student who's ready, God does tell us, if you are not only ready, but if you live the Christian life properly, there is reward for you. Put away treasures in heaven where no one can take them, no one can steal them, no one can scam you. All that stuff. I mean, it's, it's throughout scripture. Jesus is giving us not only warnings, but he's saying, hey, this is real. Where you're headed is real. You're going to one of two places. You're either going to be with me or you're going to be with the devil. You're going to, go, you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. One of the two. The student who blows off the announcement or simply doesn't care, that's not smart. The student who positions themselves in the right spot, paying attention, is the one that is most prepared and the one that's most ready. And the one who probably is continuing throughout the day until that happens to think about it. That's what we got to be like. We got to be thinking about Christ's return. It gets very, very difficult when, when things are super prosperous and uh, the weather's perfect and, and life is just sailing along. It's very difficult to live that way. Secondly, in this chapter, the dynamics of whether you get married or not are less important than simply being ready. So whatever God calls you to, he, lives you, he, lives you, uh, he give, uh, uh, asks you to be single and to, I mean, you don't have to like be single and like, I have to be a missionary. I have to go out to Greece or Africa or wherever. Be a missionary, where, be on mission wherever you are, whatever job you work at. But no matter what it is, being ready in whatever state, married, divorced, single, whatever, be ready. We do well to not be tied down to worldly things. Doesn't mean don't, up, don't have worldly things. God makes us managers of worldly things. I, I have rental houses. I manage them. But I'm not like, oh man, I, if, if God ever took those for me, then I, I don't know if I would follow him. I will tell you that that is, it's not something that I contemplate, but when God takes things from you, you struggle. So sometimes there's, I mean, there's giftings for people that manage stuff really, really, really well. That's a gift. That is not something that's just like, eh, I just stumbled on being a, a really good manager. God gives talent in that world. And God gives a spiritual gifting of things like that too. When he talks about the talents, that's, that's a great comparison. But when you have a lot of stuff, if you were to lose a lot of stuff, sometimes that's a deterrent. Sometimes that's, oh, I'm so depressed because I lost everything in this world. I know, but what if your life was required of you next week? Would it matter? It wouldn't matter, but you don't know that. And so sometimes we really struggle. So keep a light touch on this world. The underlying theme of be ready is don't be so yoked down. Don't be so tied down to all of the things the earth has. The earth has some really, really great stuff. I mean, if whatever you're into, you can find something super cool to be into, to be like, oh, that's my hobby. I like that. I like, I like hunting. I like hiking. I like uh, boats. I like whatever it is. The earth is gorgeous. Every day I open up my laptop and 
yet Windows shows me another picture of a place I'll never be able to afford to go to. Okay? And yes, I click, I like it. Who's a castle in Scotland? You can never go. Um, here's Cabo San Lucas. You can never go. Um, although not a good week for Cabo this last week. Um, but usually it is. For the life here, for the Christian here, when Christ comes back is paramount for our heads. Because if you never, ever, ever think about it, what's the rush? What's the urgency? And so be ready. Live ready. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, the text. And uh, though this chapter has been, um, it's dealt with so many things. We know that uh, what you're calling us to is ready living. We know, Lord, that uh, things are, are fading away, things are passing away, things are getting worse, as they will, and as they always do. When mankind runs the show, things get worse. And God, it's good for us to see these things. It's good for us to uh, just kind of settle in to where you have us, to keep our eyes fixed on you. God, help us with that. If there's things we need to shed, if there's things we need to get rid of, if there's relationships we need to uh, push the pause button on, please, God, give us the strength to do that. Give us wise friends that can help us. Give us great counsel. In Jesus' name, amen.